Hi, my name is Alan Prost and I'm going to talk to you today about non a compensated back pressure flow meters. And the reason we're talking about those, one, we need to understand about the mechanical aspects of how these devices work within the hospital and as respiratory therapist expert in the field, we need to understand all the components and how the needle valve controls the resistance to control our flow rate through the device. That's important, but also the basic concepts of how we create pressure gradients resulting in flow is important for us, both, both for mechanical devices such as a flow meter and, may, and um, mechanical ventilators, which we're going to be using, as well as within the body system, you'll see that we use that same equation, the same kind of characteristics, looking at how do we create flow by creating pressure gradients within the body. So we're going to talk about back pressure compensated flow meters, but we're also introducing the concepts of how we use pressure gradients to overcome resistance to create flow. So our learning objectives today are to learn about back pressure compensated flow meters and how they work in the components of this mechanical device. We're also going to learn how to describe pressure gradients and how when we do that we create flow and we usually have to get, create that past a known or a unknown resistance. We're going to see how these elements come together within the equation. Flow is a result of a pressure gradient overcoming resistance. So another way we can write that is that we can say flow, which is often depicted as this, is going to overcome our pressure gradient. And in this case, we're going to come from the wall pressure and where the pressure gradient we're going to have is compared to the atmospheric pressure, which is zero um, PSIG, and we're overcoming the resistance often shown in this. And we can um, rewrite uh, that equation to solve for resistance as well. We can actually look at the same components and just interpose the flow in here. So by using this same equation, we can solve for flow and we can solve for resistance. But more importantly, we can understand how creating a pressure gradient creates flow. So here we have a basic um, back pressure compensated flow meter. Right in here is where it plugs into the wall outlet and that's hooked up to 50 PSI. Now it could be a tank with a regulator on the end or any kind of gas source, but it's designed to work within the Thorpe tube here is this is a Thorpe tube in here and it's designed to work at 50 psi we often call it 50 pounds per square inch gauge all right so within this we've got our Thorpe tube right here and there's a little ball right there that moves up and down and indicates the uh, flow rate right in here so that indicates our flow now we adjust that by adjusting this um, needle valve right here. By turning the needle valve we reduce the resistance and we allow flow to come through the device out to the bottom here. And that can be hooked up to uh, our oxygen tubing or a nasal cannula or any kind of device where we need oxygen or whatever gas we're working with. So another way to tell if you've got a, a compensated flow meter is when you plug it into a wall outlet, like here, you'll notice the little ball inside jumps up and then comes back down. And that's because the pressure from the wall outlet is equalizing within this Thorpe tube inside here. So here we have a graphic representation of a flow meter right in here. And we're trying to show you exactly what's going on with the real flow meter here. So what we have is we have 50 PSI, so some kind of gas source, usually from a wall unit, where we can actually screw that right into the wall where we have a gas system. And they often run within hospitals at about 50 PSIG. So these are specifically calibrated for this exact pressure. Now we have, um, so you can see here, we have the Thorpe tube here. And of course, here's our Thorpe tube. Here's our indications for when the ball is inside. Here's our little um, indicator ball. When it's being held at these levels, that will be the flow rate that's being delivered to our oxygen therapy device. So you can see we've got the same things right in here. What's important to recognize is that we have the um, resistor right here, which is our needle valve. 
And that needle valve is being depicted by um, this part right in here in our diagram over here. So this is our needle valve. And right now it's showing that it's closed. So there's no flow at this time. And that's why the ball is sitting down here at the bottom. It's important to recognize that there's 50 PSI throughout the Thorpe tube and within the um, flow meter itself. All right. Once we get on this side, so on this side of the needle valve, there's 50 PSI. On this side, there's just room air or room pressure, which is actually zero pressure uh, pounds per square inch gauge. All right. So a gauge would show that there's no there's no pressure in here. It's both just atmospheric pressure. Now in this diagram, you can see that we actually have opened up our needle valve. So there's a little space in here for gas to now flow through the device. And we can see that the flow of gas is supporting our, our ball here. And right now we're delivering five liters per minute. So what's happening is we have now gas rushing through here from our wall outlet or gas source. And it's supporting our little ball there, holding it up inside the Thorpe tube. And that gas flow is coming out and going right around through here, right past our controlling resistor, our needle valve, and out towards our oxygen therapy device. All right, so this critical component in here is our resistor or our needle valve, and it's controlling our flow rate. All right, and you want, I want to bring you back to that equation. We know that by controlling the resistance, when we have a known pressure gradient, we're going to create flow, all right? So if the resistance is closed, in other words, if it's sealed, obviously there's not gonna be any pressure gradient or any flow. But once we start opening that up and our resistance decreases, we're going to increase flow rate, all right? As resistance increases, all right, the pressure gradient is gonna stay the same. We're gonna look at that. But as resistance increases, flow will decrease. So it's an inverse relationship. Now the pressure gradients that we have across there are important to note because they are going to be, um, they're going to show us what is going on with our system here. We're going to be able to make some calculations with that. All right, so when we look at that pressure gradient, we know on one side of the resistor, we have, we have 50 PSIG, all right? And that's our pressure one. So if we look over here, we're gonna see that within, on this side of the gauge, we've got 50 PSI. And over here, once it gets outside past the resistor, the pressure is effectively zero or atmospheric pressure. So it's zero PSIG. So our pressure gradient is always going to stay the same. It's always going to be 50. All right. Now, we don't know what the resistance is, but because of the where the ball is being held within the Thorpe tube, and because this is um, precisely calibrated for 50 PSI um, pressure gradients, we'll be able to know our flow rate precisely and that it this time is five liters per minute. So we'll be able to do the calculation and figure out what our resistance is. So in this case, we can solve for the resistance. We could say that, okay, so our resistance is equal to 50 divided by five, which will be equal to 10 PSI per liter per minute. Now, that's a little bit unusual um, units for medicine, but it is a good unit for working with um, higher resistors, like with flow meters. Within the human body, we'll, uh, we'll use uh, different units. We'll use centimeters of water per liter per second. So what we've done is we've taken that basic equation of resistance is equal to a pressure gradient. We need a pressure gradient to create flow. And in this case, what we've done is we've got 50 PSI and our resistor is controlled by this needle valve in here. So the more we open up that needle valve, we decrease the resistance 
and increase the flow rate. All right. So we can actually now calculate what the resistance is. Remember this uh, flow meters are specifically calibrated for to work at 50 PSI. So in this diagram, we've opened up our resistance a little bit more. We've created a larger gap inside here. So we've actually decreased our resistance from the previous slide. So what we have is we have gas flowing through our flow meter, through our Thorpe tube, holding up our little indicator ball, flowing through our device, across our resistance, and out to our oxygen therapy device. The critical element being that we're controlling our flow rate with this resistor in here. We're using that classic equation. We're using, we're adjusting the flow rate, the resistance. We've got a set pressure gradient. And the result of that is going to be a flow rate. All right. That's what we're doing with our flow meter. So compared to our last situation, we've decreased the resistance. And I know that because we have the same flow rate. We've got 50 for our P1, PSIG, and we've got zero for our, on the other side of our resistor, because it's just atmospheric pressure. And we know from looking at our flow meter that we've achieved, because we're looking at our little indicator ball, that we've achieved exactly um, 10 liters per minute. Now we can calculate that resistance and we're going to see that that's going to be 50 divided by uh, 10, which is going to equal 5. All right. And that's our resistance. Now that is uh, a decreased resistance compared to what we had in the other uh, scenario because our, our needle valve is more wide open. So we've decreased resistance and the outcome of that was we went from 5 liters per minute to 10 liters per minute flow. By creating um, a uh, less of an obstruction, by decreasing the resistance with the same pressure gradient, we still have 50 on this side of the um, resistor and zero pressure on the other side, we actually increase our flow rate. All right, so that's the big concepts that I wanted you to learn today. And we're going to apply these same concepts, this same equation, in a multitude of systems, both within the body and mechanical systems, like what I'm showing here with our flow meter. We use this in resistance uh, with uh, ventilators. We use it to control ventilators. We use it to control gas flow within the lungs themselves. Thank you very much. So what we'd like to do now is compare the difference between a back pressure compensated flow meter to a non-compensated flow meter. Now this is a very simplistic one that I have here. And the big difference is that when this is operating, the pressures inside the Thorpe tube are atmospheric, all right? Or they're zero PSIG as compared to the um, but compensated one, which is going to be at 50 PSIG in there. So the big thing to remember, and I'm going to give it a little demonstration for this, is that this one is going to be unaffected by resistance downstream. When you create uh, resistance downstream in here, I'm going to get a little demonstration for that. You're changing the dynamics or the atmospheric pressure within inside that Thorpe tube. And that's going to change the density of the gas and alter how the ball will be carried by the supporting gas. So let's see what that looks like. So non-compensated flow meters do have a role within respiratory therapy and within the hospital because not all of our systems, like our wall outlets and our regulators are calibrated to 50 PSI. Liquid systems have different pressures. Sometimes we have different regulators hooking up to different gas sources. So when we have a wide variety of different uh, gas pressures to work with, we know that the back pressure compensated flow meters require a specific calibration at a specific pressure to be accurate. All right? They need a specific pressure, in this example, 50 PSI within the Thor tube, to be accurate. 
non-compensated or non-compensated back pressure flow meters such as this little device here don't require a specific operating pressure and they will be accurate provided that it's atmospheric pressure or just room air pressure within the Thorpe tube. Now they're actually calibrated to um, sea level but for most of us even at five or six thousand feet the variation in the density between sea level and at slightly higher elevations is minimal. So these can be re relied upon to read accurately in a wide variety of settings with gases of any pressure going into the inlet here because it's atmospheric pressure inside the Thorpe tube. Now the beauty of a uh, compensated flow meter is that whatever flow rate we set on the device and we control the flow rate with our little opening up the little valve here and you can see we can set a flow rate here on the on the Thorpe tube by controlling the height of that little ball. So if I set this up to four and I've got it hooked up to my patient or some oxygen tubing, regardless of how much resistance or what happens on the other end, you can see if I totally plug it, it should read accurately. All right, so it's very hard to plug this because it's got 50 feet PSI coming in behind it. Now this is very different than a non-compensated flow meter like this one here, all right? The difference is inside this Thorp tube is 50 PSI. Inside this Thorp tube is atmospheric pressure. So when I put them together like this, you should see that the, um, the flow rate is the same for both of them. It's about four. See that's set four here, and I've got four set on my flow meter here. But when I create pressure inside the system, so I put a little extra resistance on there by plugging the flow of gas that's coming up through the Thorpe tube like this, you'll notice that this ball in this one, the non-compensated flow meter, goes down. And that's because the density of the gas inside here has increased and changed the ability to hold the ball up. So these are very accurate, provided you are operating at atmospheric pressures within the Thorpe tube. All right? And when you create any resistance, so it's non-compensated, because it doesn't compensate for the changes in resistance downstream or on the other side of the flow in the Thorpe tube. Compensated flow meters always read accurately, regardless of the amount of resistance created. So if I totally plug it, like this, you'll notice they both go to zero. But if I let a little bit of flow out here, it's the compensated flow meter that will be accurate. So, thank you very much for watching this video about back pressure compensated and differentiating between those and non-compensated flow meters and how that basic equation of creating a pressure gradient past resistance results in flow and these apply both to mechanical systems and the human body. Thank you very much.